Kannaburan, to have you here in our international conference and uh, the special address that you would be giving uh, in this session. Um, now, uh, you have not been unknown to us. I mean, some uh, as students, we studied you in Delhi University. So in sociology departments, you have been read. In political science departments, you have been read. Uh, in law, you have been read. So uh, you need no introduction. You, we have few scholar activists uh, in academia, and you are uh, you're one of the very hard-earned representative uh, and the respectability of scholarship. So we are absolutely delighted, ma'am. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to speak in this international conference. Uh, for those who have who might be hearing Professor Kannabiran for the first time, uh, Professor Kannabiran has been associated as a director of Council for Social Development, Hyderabad. She just gave us, uh, she broke the news that she resigned from the Institute three days back. She is also a co-founder of the Ashmita Resource Center for Women. She has been trained as a sociologist and as a lawyer. She has combined research teaching of law and sociology. She has done pro bono social legal counseling and she has been a rights advocate in her work. Her research over the years has focused on women's studies and gender studies and she's still actively engaging in some of the questions of women's studies and gender studies in general. Uh, her title of the special address is Insurgent Realisms and Ideas of Justice in India, Imagining the Corruption Complex to Law and Literature. Before I invite Professor Kannabiran to deliver a special address, there is a point, uh, there's a note that all the participants should uh, mute their microphones and if they have any questions, which we will take up at the end of the session, uh, at the end of the uh, speech of Professor Kannabiran uh, in a direct message to me, and I'll read out to Professor Kannabiran. So uh, thank you, uh, Professor Kannabiran, for accepting our invitation. Over to you, ma'am. I would like to uh, begin by uh, thanking the organizers uh, of the conference, uh, Dr. Bini, uh, Dr. Purvi, uh, Dr. Kunal, and anybody else who's been involved in the organizing. And I would like to thank uh, the participants uh, for coming on, on board for this session. Uh, I have, uh, for some years now, uh, been uh, looking quite closely at the relationship uh, between law and literature. Uh, this uh, initially started with my interest in uh, literatures of dissent, uh, which have their uh, origins in the in the post-colonial uh, in post-colonial India, uh, have origins that are extremely visible and uh, vocal in the immediately pre-emergency, emergency, and post-emergency period. That is the, the late, very late 1960s to about uh, the late 1970s. You have an outpouring of creative writing in different Indian languages uh, that are uh, directly uh, related to uh, the state and repressive law. Uh, and uh, my own experience has been that the connection between law and literature, while it was kind of uh, very evident and staring you in the face, uh, was not in fact opened up as a trope in looking at literatures of dissent. And so that is really uh, where I began uh, to look at it uh, in, in uh, a very different way through the chronicles of dissent uh, in the state that I belong to and I have worked all my life in the former state of Andhra Pradesh, uh, now Telangana. So uh, as part of that, uh, I, more recently uh, during lockdown, I uh, decided to look at the problem of corruption and so I wrote a piece which I will be, uh, it, it is a longish essay, so do bear with me. I uh, will take about an hour uh, to go through with it. Uh, and it is 
uh, a piece that looks at uh, the relationship between law and literature as one might understand it through um, different uh, Indian literatures, either in their original languages or in translation. And so that basically is uh, what I wanted to look at. And one of the things that I have, one of, one, one of the ideas that I am posing is that you can't understand corruption as discrete practices. Uh, you can only understand it as a complex. So that's what I call the corruption complex. So with your permission, I will go through uh, with my lecture. Yes, ma'am. Uh, corruption has, for the past few decades, been a global preoccupation as never before and is a vacuous political signifier in every locale we pick. It is there everywhere, yet it isn't anywhere, as we witnessed in the Notbandi actions triggered by the Indian government with the explicit purpose of choking off what they call black money. And yet, despite its hollowness as a political stake in probity, it continues to reign supreme as the enemy that must be vanquished. This raises importantly, not the question of why laws are ineffective or why successive political regimes escape accountability, or even why judges can never be impeached on grounds of corruption despite having formal procedures in place, but rather points to the need for a deep engagement with the circulation of ideas, imagination, consensus, and resistance to corruption in the everyday at different sites of life, government, and politics. A, a sorry, a constitutive element in what I call the corruption complex in Indian literature is the law. Colonial law and its fossils in the post-colonial period and neoliberal legal regimes as also law that is constitutive of the decolonized state, the constitution, for instance. Apart from formal law, we also have the incessant prescription and destabilization of norm and normativity in Indian creative writing. How might we excavate radical critique in the fictional narration of corruption? It is important to understand the ways in which tales of corruption circulate and the effect this has on those who share in the lives and travels of the tale over time. I'm also interested in the relationship Akhil Gupta traces between structural violence and corruption. In all the stories that we traverse through today, it is structural violence and state practice that anchors corruption, as we will see. The common Indian's critique of corruption, therefore, is inseparable from their wider critique of the social order that is embedded within the many layers in which corruption proliferates. In opening up the idea of insurgency, I use Ranajit Guha's classic elementary aspects of peasant insurgency in colonial India as the founding text. Looking at novels and stories in a sense is a way of getting, to use Guha's words, in touch with the consciousness of insurgency. And I would add its multiple and simultaneous locations. Elementary Aspects provides the context for our reading of the stories in part one. In looking at the post-colonial state, Akhil Gupta in red tape questions the ontic status of the state and interrogates the, corrupt, the construction of the unitary state and its reification by providing a disaggregated view of the everyday routinized practices that together cre create regimes of rule at different levels, each with its own logic and inherent complexities. Folklore around corruption abounds and stories of corruption circulate incessantly embellished in each successive cycle. One of the stories I look at in part two has been examined by Gupta in red tape. This is Rag Darbari by Sri Lal Shukla. Mapping the political history of technology in India, Arun Sukumar argues that in the first two decades of the 20th century, despite the surge of Swadeshi and the boycott of British goods, Congress leaders like Madan Mohan Malviya foresaw the impossibility of industrial development in India without foreign technology. We also know that this current government, despite the make in India, cannot do without Rafael. Yet for him, the guiding ethic of religion was indispensable to the Hindus, as there was, he argued, I quote, the risk that unfettered modernization would affect the faith of the Hindus, unquote. 
Sukumar's work then, Midnight Machines, is, the, is immediately relevant to our argument on the constitutive place of the state in corruption narratives that straddle the earth and outer space, the moon or Antariksh, as the case may be, as we will see in the stories in part three. I'm interested in the ways in which each of these works speaks to the corruption complex. Pertinent to our exploration are Jennifer Vargas's definition of critical realism in the context of Fakir Mohan Senapati's Six Acres and a Third, an Odia novel in located in colonial India, which narrates social realities oppositionally and di dialogically, as she says. And Francesca Orsini's description of the uses of irony and satire that I quote, enables a wide ranging critique of post-colonial Indian state and society by setting up correlations between apparently incongruous elements linking the sublime with the ridiculous. As for instance, when Srilal Shukla in Rag Darbari compares the economic and political value of a filthy village pond to, I quote, the way that any developing country, despite its backwardness, has some economic and political importance, unquote. Vishnu Khare observes that in opting for satire as his chosen genre and weapon, Harishankar Parsai lost no opportunity in exposing and lampooning, lampooning the predatory class of na native masters who rose after independence. Corrupt bureaucrats, avaricious politicians, amoral businessmen, rapacious contractors, permit brokers and middlemen smugglers and mafia dons, and much worse purveyors of linguistic, regional and caste hatreds and the fundamentalist fascists of various faiths." Unquote. Across all these texts, the nexus between religious performance and corruption is parodied from within, deepening the insurgent possibilities of the narrative. We see therefore a tentative congealing of the corruption complex and its temporalities, through insurgent realism in storytelling in India. The characters and context are not so distant, nor unreal, nor do they speak unfamiliar tongues. For, to borrow from Mikhail Bakhtin, the boundaries between fiction and nonfiction are not laid up in heaven. Irreverence for authority then sits at the heart of the telling. I present snippets of six texts, four originally written in Hindi, one in Odia and one in English, between 1901 and 2019. Fakir Mohan Senapati's Six Acres and a Third in Odia, 1901, which provides us with a useful starting point in mapping the contours of justice as distinct from law, and Munshi Premchand's story Namakka Daroga, which is 1913, written in Hindi, which is a story of corruption set in the early 20th century that spins out the complex indistinctions between what is morally permissible and legally wrong. Then I look at Srilal Shukla's Rag Darbari, 1968, published in translation in English in 2012, set in early independent India in the late 1950s, the author Shukla, an officer of the Indian Administrative Service. And Vibhuti Narayan Rai's Kisa Lok Tantra in Hindi, 1993, which narrates the story of the criminalization of politics. The author Rai, an officer of the Indian police service at the time of writing. Finally, we move to fictional narratives of the corruption complex that pertain to outer space, the moon, Antariksh, and what is it that interweaves the high world of space science with the lowly worlds of Inspector Matadin? The two works of fiction that I look at in this section our Harishankar Parsai's short story, Inspector Matadin on the Moon, 1968, written at the same time that Srilal Shukla wrote Rag Darbari, and Veena Rao's Asuras of Antariksh, an English novel written in 2019, which is located in Indian forays into science and technology and is a field that spawns large corruption complexes over different state regimes, and Veena Rao was an officer of the Indian Administrative Service. Two of these works are set in rural India, Orissa and UP, to speak to the rural urban continuum, that liminal space that bears the characteristics of the margins in its many meanings, notably of urban ruralities, 
and the last two pertain to outer space and straddle the metropolis, the political and educational space shuttles that connect to the moon. The sites of storytelling move in a manner of speaking from a village or small town thoroughfare to a tea shop that stands witness on the edge of town to a spaceship that might never take off or at best have an aborted launch. In terms of the location of the protagonist and the location of the writer, what does the view from below mean? In focusing on corruption tales and their rootedness in structural violence, we could, after Satya Mohanty, excavate, I quote, social critique as articulated in literature, unquote. And we could explore how literary imagination helps us render subaltern agency and expressions of justice as distinct from law or legality legible. So part one then, six acres and a third, is a story set in early 20th century Odisha of an evil Zamindar Mahajan, a landlord moneylender, Ramachandra Mangaraj, and the destruction he wreaks on the poor. It is a story of the courts of law and colonial courts. And ultimately, it is a story of the colors of justice as imagined in worldviews that are situated subaltern, regional, and gendered in particular ways that partake in the larger global discourses on ideas of justice. Quintessentially a text that speaks to ideas of justice, it lends itself to a rich unraveling through the medium of law and literature. The novel is a busy thoroughfare, dense, diverse, intensely mobile, connecting people and worlds. But through it all, we could signpost Mangaraj, the main character, his wife Santani, his mistress Champa, the weaver Bhagya, and his wife Sarya, whom Mangaraj dispossesses by stealing Neta their cow and their six acres and a third, and the impecunious landlord Dildarmia, who is divested of his estate by Mangaraj the moneylender. But Dildar's father acquired his estate by deceit, which Dildar inherits. The narrator offers critique, commentary, description, and provides a measure of justice through the very act of bearing witness to the depredations of Mangaraj and his minions. The question that confronts us on reading this story is, what is corruption? What are its micro practices, its habitations, its circulations, and how are the ends of justice met? In what locales, in what ways does a critique of corruption circulate to disengage corruption from its moorings. The travels between lives as lived, the supernatural and the banal in this thoroughfare are also instructive, as also the banality of the supernatural and the majesty of truthful lives. We encounter several pieces of it. The word bribe is used a few times, but the bribe being spoken about is insignificant in its ability to turn life worlds upside down. It is simply a small price for fixing a particular problem, usually with an agent of state, the daroga or the inspector or officers of the court, lawyers and magistrates. I quote from the novel, he, Mangaraj, was a very pious man indeed. This is indisputable. Every Ekadashi, he fasted, taking nothing but water and a few leaves of the sacred basil plant for the entire day. Just the other afternoon though, Mangaraj's barber, Jaga, let it slip that on the evenings of Ekadasis, a large pot of milk, some bananas, and a small quantity of Kai and Nabata are placed in the master's bedroom. Very early the next morning, Jaga removes the empty pot and washes it. Hearing this, some people exchanged knowing looks and chuckled. We would like to plead his case as follows. Let the eyewitness who has seen Mangaraj emptying the pot come forward. For like judges in a court of law, we are absolutely unwilling to accept hearsay and conjecture as evidence. All the more so since science textbooks state unequivocally, liquids evaporate. Is milk not a liquid? Why should milk in a zamindar's household defy the laws of science? Besides, there were moles, rats, and bugs in his bedroom. And in whose house can mosquitoes and flies not be found? Like all base creatures of appetite, 
these are always on the lookout for food. Such creatures are not spiritually minded like Mangaraj, who had the benefit of listening to the holy scriptures. It would be a great sin then to doubt Mangaraj's piety or unwav unwavering devotion." Unquote. The cohabitation of a publicly rehearsed piety with deceit is a theme that recurs in accounts of wealthy men of God, both Godmen and lesser mortals in the country to this day in India and figures in one way or another in all the six writings presented here, not intentionally. The interweaving of colonial juristic sensibilities as evidence, the validity of hearsay on, and conjecture as evidence of wrongdoing, for instance, the deployment of the methods of science to de desired effect and the vicarious presentation of the analogy between base creatures of the appetite, that is rats, bugs, flies, and pious zamindars, sets up scenes of the crimes of corruption, as it were, that will be enacted in very many different ways along this thoroughfare and beyond. And if we do not question the mysterious ways of Jesus Christ and Krishna, why should we doubt Mangaraj? From the spiritual world then, let us move to the material world of Mangaraj. By the time the narrator is done with telling us of Mangaraj's Ekadashi, we have our ears pricked up for more gory stories to follow. The sense that this can't be all there is to this man's story of cheating, deceit, and base temperament. From cheat meals to capturing the village markets to selling off gifts for a price, the unethical melds with the illegal and is inseparable from it. How might we disentangle one strand from this knot and name it corrupt? Which is corrupt and which is not? What is the larger tangle from which this is, of which this is but a part? What are the semantic fields of corruption, so to speak? Our sensibilities of justice are aroused, propelling us to adhere to the rules of law and move beyond hearsay in our investigation of the goings on here in this protectorate of this one man. Structural violence, poverty and vulnerability to the moneylender trapped the poor in the, uh, trapped the poor in the village in Mangarad's deathly coils. We're then speaking also of theft, of crop, of property, of labor. And we are speaking of the evil man while there is undoubtedly the socialization of corruption that we must be attentive to, the delegitimization of corruption also offers counter moves simultaneously. So that even while corrupt practices and crime interlock to exacerbate vulnerability and deep oppressions, the resistance to that complex also fall, unfolds incessantly. The tussle between blind faith and superstition and the rationality of medicine to cure ailments, illnesses, and barrenness. We've seen this, go Corona, go, for instance. As also blind faith as the sole refuge against misfortune makes the trope of goddesses and godmen, the supernatural mortal nexus, critical to corruption folklore. Miracles, magic, trances, visions, revelations, dreams, provide the medium for the enactment of acts of goddesses by men and women who possess them. I quote, the goddess did not enjoy a regular monthly income the way lowly clerks do. People gathered at her shrine only in, terms, in times of danger and distress as they do at the doors of doctors and lawyers. And again, Bhima's mother, the Baba woman said, I saw the goddess riding her tiger. What a huge one it was. Then four or five old men in the village supported her story. It was now established beyond a doubt that the goddess had appeared in the village the night before." Unquote. The Muslim, the Sahib, the Daroga, the Zamindar, the district magistrate, English, Persian, Sanskrit, plurilinguality and the cadences of each language in its colonial encampment provide a rich density to the sociolingual traffic on this thoroughfare along which we attempt to plot the idea of corruption. Most interestingly, however, 
a Brahmin's blessing to a deputy collector who ruled in his favor was that he should become a Daroga. And I'm quoting Senapati. The narration of corruption is an intensely insurgent one that intertwines tales of oppression with tales of corruption. Where does imperial conquest, for instance, figure in the corruption complex? The time that Senapati is writing is also the time when British courts had just replaced the old panchayats of five elders, clearly eroding the power of situated agency. I quote, today, the law courts have opened wide their doors and people have become educated and civilized. Why should anyone heed the rule of five elders anymore? English law warns, and I quote, watch out my friend, if we obtain legally conclusive proof that you have committed a crime, you shall be punished, says the narrator. A clever man answers, sir, I know how to make sure you don't get any proof. No worry, no worry, adds the lawyer patting him on the back. Just bring me cash. I can make black, white, and white, black, unquote. Lawyers helped aspiring moneylenders win entire zamindaris through debt litigation and then themselves acquired entire zamindaris by finalizing the fine legalities of mortgage transfer and registration in a mere two hours. Zamindaris did not necessarily pass as inheritance from one generation to another in a family, but passed hands through legalized dacoity from Bhaga Singh to Dildarmia to Mangaraj to the lawyer Ram Ram Lala. In this imaginary courts are never the sites of justice. Witness the eruption of a fierce fight between vultures and jackals that prey on the rotting body of Champa, the Zamindar Mangaraj's mistress, then thrown to the crocodiles. Or Mangaraj's vision on his deathbed as he lay grievously hurt from being beaten in jail by the domes of Ratanpur, of the looming skeleton of a human with its jaws wide open watching him intently, waiting silently to devour him, that he believed was no other than the woman who had starved herself to death in front of his house because she had taken away her land." Unquote. The story of deceit and corruption is a self-perpetuating one, with the Zamindari merely passing into the deceitful hands of lawyer Ram Ram Lala, who is all set to arrive in a procession of palanquins to take possession of the estate on Makar Shankaranti. Clearly justice is unimaginable in relation to the corruption complex and can only be conceived in terms of just deserts that are intensely culturally coded in ways impermissible within the terrains of imperial or sovereign law. We will see with the next tale, Munshi Premchand's Namakka Daroga, that this intense coding is also plural and permits of multiple irresolutions. Namakka Daroga, or the Salt Inspector, written in 1913, is set in the context of the imposition of a tax on salt by the British. A young educated man, Munshi Vamshidhar, finds a job as Daroga, whose job it is to check smuggling of salt, among other things. Vamshidhar lives with his parents and wife and belongs to a family of modest means. One night, he stops carts of salt being smuggled across Yamuna in the dead of night. The smuggler is the most respected and wealthy Brahmin zamindar of the area, Pandit Alopidin. Despite being offered hefty bribes to let the carts pass, the daroga bound by duty refuses and arrests the zamindar. The village is agog with talk of the arrest. When he is produced before the magistrate the next day with the entire village crowds, the entire village crowds around the court to watch, the officers of the court, the battery of lawyers and magistrate are incensed at the gross mis disrespect shown by the Daroga to respected Panditji. The Zamindar is released and the Daroga is censured by the court for having taken the law into his hands in his overenthusiasm to perform his duty. Shamed in public and divested of his job, Banshidha returns home to the hostility of his family. A couple of days later, a bedecked cart draws up in front of his house. The elder Munshi sees Pandit Alopidin, the Zamindar, walk in with his retinue. Alopidin offers Vanshidhar a job as manager of his entire estate with a handsome salary, bungalow, and servants. 
Banshikar, initially uncomprehending, is elated and accepts the offer. This short story provides, like Six Acres, a very nuanced account of the cultural effects of British law in the colony. The ways in which colonial law is imagined as proliferating of corruption in the locality and the ways in which the locality is understood, the ways in which the locality understood the material context of corruption from their own cultural moorings, the insurgent moves triggered by the local daroga and the affective implications of this insurgency are complex and dense in their plurality. Take for instance, the opening paragraph, I quote, when the new department of salt was set up banning transactions in a commodity that was God's gift, people began to trade in salt covertly. There were various devious means that were devised. Some resorted to bribery, some by deceit. Officers had a field day. People abandoned the respected position of Patwari to be armed watchmen in this department. Even lawyers lusted after the position of a daroga in this department. Banshidhar was well-versed in Persian literatures. He got a job as daroga in the department of salt a department where there was a good salary and no limit on extra earnings, upar ki kamai. Even as he set out to look for a job, his father, a man of experience and wisdom, delivers a sermon on the need to use discretion, be worldly wise, and never look a gift horse in the mouth. He said to his son, and I quote, son, you can see the hardships we are enduring. We are weighed down by debt. We have daughters, they're growing like wild weeds. I'm a tree teetering on the edge. I know not when I will fall. You are now the head of the family. In your job, do not worry about status. It is but the shrine of a peer. Look towards the offerings and the shawls. Search for a job where there is some extra income. Your monthly salary is like the full moon. You can see it for a day and then it wanes each day till it vanishes. Extra income is like a stream flowing from the source that eternally quenches thirst. Since it is man who gives you a salary, it cannot grow. Extra earnings are the gift of God. They lead to prosperity. You are yourself a scholar. What can I teach you? You need to be prudent. Look at the person, understand his needs, and gauge the opportunity. After this, do what is best. There is only profit when you are tough with a man in need of your favors, but it is difficult to win over a man who has no need for you. Don't lose sight of these words. They are my lifetime's earnings. And I dare say politicians of today have taken the elder Munshi's words rather seriously. This casual delineation of two parallel sources of income, one human, the other a gift of God, sets up questions with respect to the cultural moorings and particularities in the corruption complex. Yet, we also witness the making of an insurgency, an intergenerational shift, both in ethics and in gestures of deference. Pandit Alopidin, the most famous zamindar in the area, a Brahmin with wealth beyond measure, had everyone, big and small, roomed in his web of indebtedness, looking upon him with benevolence from British officers who hunted on his properties to the smallest functionary in the area. He knew no government and everything was resolved as a domestic matter. Can I ever be apart from you? He asks. Wedded to an unshakable faith in the goddess Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, he believed she ruled earth and heavens. The narrator's voice, I quote, what he said was true. Justice and law are Lakshmi's playthings. She toys around with them as she wishes, unquote. Disrupts the seamlessness of Alopidin's power by pointing to the wedge that will hold the first insurgent move. When Daruga Vanshidhar orders his arrest and confiscates his carts of smuggled salt, his simple retort is, I quote, it is inconceivable that we pass this way without of making an offering to the deity on the river bank. I was on my way to you myself. Vanshida does not budge. He said sternly, I'm not from among those traitors who sell their souls for a few coins. You are under arrest. You will be charged according to procedure. I do not have the time to waste. Jamadar Badlu Singh, I order you to arrest him. Unquote. In persisting, Vanshida is inaugurating an insurgency. 
against the old order, which he was schooled into by his aging father, and the new colonial order that was already cradled in and benumbed by the cozy hospitality of Pandit Alopidin. Pandit Ji had never before beheld law disregard wealth. The ground he stood on was crumbling under his feet. His prestige and wealth were both badly hit, <clears throat> but he still did not lose faith in the power of wealth. He turned to his assistant, Lala Ji, give Babu Sahib 1000 rupees. He is like a hungry lion now, unquote. The offer went climbing from 1000 to 40,000, but the effort was futile. Wealth had been stamped down by the law, I quote, and Pandit Ji fainted seeing the constable approach him with handcuffs. The corruption complex is sustained and perpetuated by intrigue, doublespeak, and multiple norms operative on the relationship between persons distributed across the social ladder and the goddess Lakshmi, who did not brook being rebuffed. Once he is produced in court, Pandit Alopidin has everyone at his service, officers, staff, lawyers, orderlies, chokidars, chaprasis, and the whole village had turned up to witness this rare event. Their disbelief, mind you, was not that Alopidin had committed the acts he had, uh, their disbelief was not that Alopidin had committed the acts he was arrested for. Their utter disbelief was that it was at all possible for the law to trap him. I quote, a man like him, who possessed inestimable wealth and unparalleled powers of persuasion, how did he get trapped by the law?" Unquote. The insurgency of law plays itself out in court yet again, when an entire army of lawyers readying themselves, I quote, in the battlefield of justice, law and wealth readied themselves for a war, when she, uh, Prem Chand says, a war in which Daruga Vanchidar stood in silence, alone, I quote, with no power save the truth and no weapon save bare facts, unquote. Witnesses wavered from greed and justice was beginning to desert Vanchita. The irony was, I quote, that the whole of justice but its, and its employees were blinded by bias. What union is possible between justice and bias? Where there is bias, there is their justice is inconceivable, is it not? The case concluded predictably in favor of Pandit Alopidin. Vanchitar emerged from the courtroom vanquished, with, but with his head held high, as realization dawned on him. I quote, justice and scholarship, long-winded titles, long flowing beards, flowing robes, none of these are deserving of true respect, unquote. The twist in the tale is that is presented as the conclusion, where Alopidin offers Vanchitar the job of a manager of his estate, opens up the trope of corruption, on a different axis. What does the recognition of integrity present to us, especially in terms of the nesting of integrity in the belly of corruption, so as to safeguard an estate built on principles antithetical to the one that Daroga had embraced? Are we then witnessing an insurgency of a different kind, where honesty and corruption are relative, in this instance to the colonial power, or are there absolute measures of corruption? Yashwant Chital, the Kannada writer, uses the metaphor of the hunt to train our gaze into the interior worlds of people trapped in intertwined worlds of subterfuge, stigma, intrigue, and corruption, making the negotiation through this thoroughfare, which also entails self-conscious participation, distinct from complicity, inescapable in the search for meaning and a sense of self-worth. Although Chital's novel Shikari speaks of a different time and context, the unraveling of the interiorities of the human worlds circulating around intrigue, which for him is constitutive of corruption, points to possibilities for a layered understanding of the corruption complex. And Shikari is not a novel that I will go into in any great detail. I move now to part two, Ragdarbari, by Srilal Shukla, written in 1968, is the story of a young educated man, Ranganath, who after completing his MA, goes to the home of his maternal uncle, Vaidyaji, in Shivpalgant, a village in Uttar Pradesh, for rest and recuperation. 
The novel is an enactment of the everyday life and its deep ironies, its contradictions, the medley of characters and crisscrossing narrators that together dismantle a linear utopian description of an Indian village. A, a central thread of living life in the everyday is corruption and its utter normalization narrated in insurgent village voices that destabilize its normalcy even while narrating it. The second novel in this part, or the fourth one that I'm looking at, Kissa Loktantra, the, the Tale of Democracy by Vibhuti Narayan Rai, is a story of Pipi, a petty criminal turned mafia don, who aspires to political office and decides to contest an election. Chaudhary Jagatpal, the neta, the, the neta, who initiates him into the world of organized crime, is a protector turned adversary who must be hunted down. While the story itself is in the nature of a commentary on the trajectories of the criminalization of politics in India from the 1970s, it is also the story of the resilience of democracy, the small lone voice of resistance, Bagi, the aging alcoholic journalist that shakes the complicity, the, the complacency of brute force. Tracing the connections between Rag Darbari and Kissa Lok Tantra in a sense, Rai's narrator plots the kinship between crime and politics in independent India, but importantly also traces the kinship of this system with the one that Mangaraj lauded over in Six Acres in the early 1900s. I quote from Rai, after independence, <clears throat> the first generation of national leaders were heady with idealism. For them, it was inconceivable to have an open relationship with criminals. After two or three general elections, for the new generation that entered the fray, idealism was seen as dishonest. But even for them, open connivance with criminals was unthinkable. They would meet in the dead of night, use them for elections, but were reluctant to let the veil drop, unquote. But this gradually began to change. And how? I quote, alongside their use in elections, the social status of criminals underwent fundamental changes. Earlier, Despite his capacity to spread terror and violence, the criminal had no social standing. Now, big mafia dons began to cultivate politicians. They set up politicians to contest in different constituencies and ensured that they won. These politicians stood before them with folded hands. When their saviors were in difficulty, they barked and pounced on officers." Unquote. Situated in the alluvial plains of the Yamuna, Pipi's village was one of Ahirs and Gujars. I quote, there was little agriculture possible in the plains, but there were two vocations that ensured a good income to this and neighboring villages. They were dairy and liquor brewing. Every family owned sturdy buffaloes and cows and a couple of breweries. The market for both businesses was Delhi. The women of the household rose at 2.30 every morning and milked the cattle. By three, the men rushed to the station with cans of milk. There was one train to Delhi that left before dawn. This train ran primarily for the milkmen. In the day, they, they were at the breweries. The entire plains had pots with fermenting mahua pressed into the earth. Anyone who set out on a boat in daytime could see from afar the breweries and the smoke that rose from them. Excise officials and police would from time to time carry out their duties and destroy the breweries and break the pots submerged in the ground. However, the following day, things returned to normalcy. As a matter of fact, government officials and the people of these villages had a peculiar love-hate relationship. They paid the requisite bribes, rishwat, to the office, officials. They carried on their businesses. They got caught. They paid bribes, resumed their businesses. This went on, unquote. The daily business of living bears a striking resemblance to Daroga Van Shidhar's time, and yet it is vastly different. This is not the time of the British salt laws. It is the time of Nehru's temples of modern India. Law was enforced by the personnel in the police station perpetually. In Shivpalganj, for instance, I quote, the common people had great expectations of the sub-inspector and the police station's dozen or so constables. If there was a burglary in some village eight miles away in the 253 
250 to 300 villages which came under the jurisdiction of the police station, it was believed that one or the other policeman would have witnessed it. If there was a dacoity at night somewhere 12 miles away, it was expected that they would get there ahead of the dacoits. As for protection from dacoits, that was left to the magic performed by the sub inspector and his men." Unquote. But what was the difference between dacoity and bribery? Was there a difference? I quote, the sub inspector smiled and said, really, Sahib, this is too much. In the old days, dacoits used to cross rivers and mountains to collect money from your home. Remember Shole? But now they expect you to leave your home and go and deliver the money to them. Rupan Babu said, yes, that's what I'm saying. It's not dacoity. It's just bribery. The sub-inspector continued in the same tone. Bribery, theft, dacoity. Now they have all become the same. It is communism. Rupan Babu said, father says the same thing. What does he say? The same. Communism has taken over. Unquote. This exchange takes us to the heart of the problem posed by the corruption complex. It is both a question of crime in which the distinction between the distinctions people make between violent crime and economic offenses are blurred and constantly bleed into one another and a question of politics. The godlessness of communism, the spurning of faith, proliferates theft and dacoity that is indistinct from bribery. Witness a convergence between a view, the view of the everyday state as Orsini calls it, and dominant actors, Brahmins, Zamindars, Netas, gangsters, as the case may be. This is also the intimate state in which some kind of social relationship can be established. In Orsini's words, I quote, knowing personally who is in what post, where, and having a direct personal connection is crucial. And in moments of need, we see Vaidyaji departing for town to the net to network with local officials, exchanging their patronage for village ghee, his potency pills, or information about powerful astrologers. Unquote. Similarly, also, Chaudhary Jagatpal was an influential neta before whom crowds gathered with all kinds of requests from morning to night for jobs with complaints against excesses of the Thanedar knocking against the corruption of the state machinery to work out compromises and interpersonal conflicts. One of his assistants was constantly calling officers on phone. Another, seated in a small room on the side, was busy typing out letters of recommendation." Unquote. In narrating the complex, both these works of fiction draw on the common citizen's experience of the deathly coils of the serpent to present polyvocalities that parody the system in insurgent moves of resistance. From Baghi's soul and spirited confrontation of PP's electoral and other dacoities as he enters the premises to file his nomination in Kisa Lok Tantra, to the ironic description by the people of Shiv Palganj in Ragdarbari of different brands of justice that stretch from the Kaurilla brand, from the weed that grows on barren land, for the low-bred man to the unreachability of the High Court and Supreme Court, which the narrator tells us, I quote, you could maintain a hundred hordes on what it costs to employ just one lawyer, unquote. I move now to part three. The satire, Inspector Matadin on the Moon by Harishankar Parsai, uh, written in 1968, is a scathing commentary on the state and politics, but also importantly for our purpose, it provides the ideal bridge between the mundane worlds of constables and inspectors and lowly crimes and petty bribes to the hyper elite anglicized worlds of satellites, rockets and outer space peopled by scientists whose knowledge of science was used to manipulate networks and governments alike, seal deals and salt away profits in Veena Rao's Ashuras of Antariksh. In Ashuras, while rockets were objects of arousal for scientist Maharishi, the new head of the Indian Space Association, and Antariksh, the outer space, the destination of immaculate science unfettered by men and morals with Ashuras in free fall, the government of Moon confessed to the Indian government 
the ineptitude of its police force on precisely this count. I quote from Parsai, we are an advanced civilization, but our police force is still not good enough. They fail to catch or punish criminals. We understand that you have established Ram Raj in your country. Please send one of your officers to give our men proper training, unquote. Immediately on arrival, Inspector Matadin installs and I, I, immediately on arrival at the moon, on the moon, Inspector Matadin is then sent to the moon. He installs an idol of the patron deity of the Indian police, Hanumanji, in all the police lines on the moon. For the crime of abducting Sita under section 362 IPC, I quote, Lord Hanuman had punished Ravan right there on the spot and set fire to his entire property. The police must have that kind of authority. No need to get bogged down by courts, unquote. To solve the problem of poor performance, he recommended lowering of salaries. His logic was simple, I quote, if you pay an employee little money, he wouldn't be able to live on it. Each has to make some extra money. Again, we are back to 1913, Upar Ki Kamai. Each has to make some extra money. And he can do that only if he starts catching criminals. That's the reason why we have the most efficient police system in our Ram Raj. Unquote. When a murder occurs, I quote, it's not for us to worry if it's the actual killer or someone innocent. All human beings are equal. In each of them is present a bit of the same God. We don't discriminate. We are humanists, unquote. The retort to any question of our actions should be, I quote, we know the man is innocent, but what can we do? Those at the top want it. That one sentence, those at the top want it, has always come to the rescue of our government in the last 25 years. You too should learn it well, unquote, says Inspector Matadin. The ladders in the corruption complex sustain it, and yet at each rung, it is the disentangling of the webs and the pricing open of the tentacles that are critical to its regeneration, because it is the hunt, to use Chital's imagery. The shikari might turn uh, the, the shikari might turn prey. He might become the shikar at any point, a possibility everyone from Mangaraj to PP to the scientists of Antariksh are acutely aware of. Nor are the scientists innocent of the lure of sealed covers, jaunts abroad or enticements of a Swamiji or a Godman, I quote, who is in seclusion and deep meditation in some grand resort that he owns in the Aegean, unquote. Only the scale, location, political, and discursive space may be vastly different. The wheels of law, with justice left far behind, turned on the figure of Pandit Radhelal from Shivpalgand, an unshakable witness who, the moment he stood up in court and swore to tell the truth by God and the Ganga, everyone, from the opposing side to the magistrate, knew he could only lie, unquote. He was indispensable to policing, not only by Inspector Matadin's exacting standards, but also by the standards of what Veena Rao calls the captive cockatoo, which rings a bell because the CBI has been called the caged parrot, if you will remember. I quote, do you even know who an eyewitness is? This is from the Rag Darbari. No, sorry, th th this is from Inspector Matadin on the moon. I quote, do you even know who an eyewitness is? An eyewitness is not someone who actually sees. He's the one who claims he saw. Are, the police must always have a list of eyewitnesses. In our country, we have people who eyewitness hundreds of cases every year. Our courts have recognized that these men possess some divine power that lets them foresee the place where some incident is going to happen, allowing them to reach there beforehand. I'll get you eyewitnesses. Bring me some bad characters. You know the kind? Petty thieves, gamblers, gundas, bootleggers, unquote. In due course, 
Inspector Matadin put together an entire dossier and in the process taught the police everything he knew, how to substitute FIRs, how to leave some pages blank for future use, how to change entries in the daily record, how to win over hostile witnesses, unquote. The captive cockatoo too, as if on cue, finds and unfinds evidence to implicate scientists of the Indian Space Association as the orders from the top demand, unquote. But very soon after stormy sessions in the moon parliament, the prime minister of the moon sent a confidential letter to the Indian prime minister asking him to recall Matadin. I quote, we had thought India was our friend, but only an enemy could have done what you did to us. No one comes to the help of an assault victim for fear he might himself be accused. Sons abandon their sick parents lest they be charged with murder. Children drown before people's eyes. All human relations are breaking down. Your man has destroyed almost half our civilized life. If he stays longer, he is bound to destroy the remaining half. Please call him back to your own Ramarajya and keep him there." Unquote. And Maharishi, the scientist, packs his bags and moves on an assignment to the United States, leaving the Antariksh's earthly home in the serpentine grip of Raja Bhaiya and his elite Anglophone minions. And Rudrakshi Swamiji, the godman from Kashi, I quote, who generally parked everybody's funds and blessed them all, unquote. These are the people, these are the ones who people are Amraja even four decades later. And I conclude, how is the corruption complex constituted and how do the various narratives thread together? Or are they patches in a quilt that may cohere when stitched together but do not necessarily speak to each other? Five of these six works are undoubtedly insurgent, insurgently realist stories, deeply satirical, that present a radical social critique and open up possibilities of insurgent literary imaginations. To echo Paul Sawyer's ruminations on Senapati, or even in, uh, indeed even Francesca or Sini or on Shukla or Kare on Parsai, these works attempt to present, I quote, the fullness and richness of experience from below without ignoring the anti-progressive elements that powerlessness can produce. The forms of oppression, brutality, and inherit, inherited ignorance that occur locally as well as in, cap, in the capitals and the courts, unquote. There is a mismatch between the system and expectations, causing deep distress to those trapped in this web. They may laugh at their troubles or use ridicule to cope. When an interviewer asked Shukla, I quote, is this ability to laugh in the midst of a crisis a sign of ind indomitable strength or of pervasive corruption? The answer he gave was both. It is a sign of both. And Rewind six decades on hearing that a new zamindar, the lawyer, will take over the zamindari. The villagers said to each other, this in six acres and a third, the villagers said to each other, I quote, oh horse, what difference does it make to you if you are stolen by a thief? You will not get much to eat here. You will not get much to eat there. No matter who becomes the next master, we will remain his slaves. We must look after our own interests, unquote. The interplay between the performance of faith, of self and other, and the enactments of corruption adds a twist to the insurgent worlds in the, in the tales. Manga, Ma, Mangaraj's Ekadashi practices or the sighting of the goddess Budhi Mangala astride a tiger on the night of the loot, the triumph of goddess Lakshmi over law, or the old father ruin that while darkness spread in his own, uh, while darkness spread in his own home, his son lit a lamp in the masjid, the corruption of the godless communist in independent India, Hanuman and the depredations of Ramaraja, and the Swamiji who is puppeteer of governments and scientists alike. Considering what a, a, a former civil servant, the late Mr. BPR Vittal remarked uh, shortly before he died, even gods are not above indirect pyrovi. Godmen offer a range of services along the Pairavi corruption continuum in the name of faith. The embeddedness 
of corruption complexes in religious nationalist tropes makes the parodying of acts of faith central to the critique of corruption. What is corruption? What does the corruption complex then consist of? What marks the radical critique as insurgent? How does one map the trajectories of modern Indian realism and satire in ways that acknowledge insurgent ideas and their dissemination through written speech? Not just writing or inscription, but written speech. Is the insurgent narrator a rebel? Is he gathering rage? Is he gathering the rage of rebellion or signaling it? Is the modern Indian legal in, in the modern Indian legal frames of corruption, how might we situate its nexus with structural violence? The question re that remains unshaken is, can corruption be extricated from the social forces, semi-feudal, colonial, capitalist, neo-colonial, neoliberal, that drive state practice at each moment? Interestingly, three of the authors are government officers offering fictional accounts of practices that implicate the everyday state in inescapable ways. Whether autobiographical or autoethnographic or not, the location of the teller of the tale is material to the corruption complex. At the heart of each story is an idea of justice and a deep smoldering anger over the betrayal of the aspirations of ordinary people. In their travels through the thoroughfares, their halts in the tea shops, and their sighting on the moon, their sighting of the moon, we see the ordinary everyday aspirations of ordinary people being disappeared by the everyday state and its musclemen. We hear them in their polyglot worlds, parodying the corrupt realities that ravage them, that they resist every day in small, intimate ways. Justice resides in the here and now, not a finished project not the preserve of authority, but in speech acts of common everyday people. And in this resting of justice from authority and state, in the telling of the interwoven stories of life, the law and its keepers are the object of parody and laughter. To return to Bakhtin, laughter draws its object into the zone of proximity that makes it possible to, and I quote, break open its external shell look into its center, doubt it, take it apart, dismember it, lay it bare, expose it, examine it freely and experiment with it, and demolishes the fear and piety, clearing the ground for an absolutely free investigation." Unquote. As we saw with Six Acres, Darbari, and Inspector Matadin especially, each of the works examined here points both to plurality as constitutive of these contexts and to the uses of the politics of insurgency that has had a historical presence on the subcontinent. There is an interillumination that makes all of the six works intelligible in relation to each other and in relation to, imme in, in relation to their immediate proximate contexts. Importantly, these narratives point to ways in which it is impossible to separate corruption from other deep oppressions and injustices that plague regimes of exception and extraction, seeing them instead as co-constitutive. What this writing also illustrates is heteromasculine normativities that drive the state and society in ways that invisibilize women as agents and actors and construct gender in exclusionary ways. Does this absence of women or trans persons from the narratives of the corruption complex necessarily mean that corruption is essentially masculine? Or does it mean that corruption practices take on the gendered, gendered patterns of the dominant state, dominant society, and dominant politics? I leave you with that question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Karnabiran, for your insightful presentation. Uh, there are many questions which have risen in my head and some half-baked ideas. So if time will permit later, I will ask those questions. But Dr. Bini uh, has a question, and she requested that she would uh, turn on her mic and speak uh, and ask that question. Dr. Bini, over to you. Thank you, Kunal. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. 
So when we talk about literature as social critique, one of the reasons for derision is that social critique is often mistaken for propagandist or didactic extremes of social realism. So narrative tropes like satire and allegory that uh, were employed in the works that you mentioned about give uh, several alternative modes of do doing social critique uh, through literature. So in fact, uh, I do feel that there is a vast world of difference between propagandist uh, didactic kind of literature and literature that we consider to be social critique. Could you please uh, shed light on this kind of, I mean, I feel, I sense a widespread derision when we talk about social critique because they uh, usually people consider it to be some sort of ideology inspired, a particular ideology inspired uh, social uh, realism, which is blatantly propagandist and uh, didactic. So I would like to know your thoughts about it. Uh, well, I, um, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, as, as a response, I mean, uh, not, uh, I, I must also confess that I am not a literature person. I come to this uh, mainly from, uh, from sociology and as a reader of literature rather than somebody who has been schooled. Uh, into literature as a specialist. But um, uh, basically, I think my uh, responses would be two. One is uh, to say that uh, we might actually find, um, and we often do find uh, critique uh, embedded uh, uh, unexpectedly in literature that is outside of, of you know, what you uh, call the propagandist realm. And of course, there is propaganda and there is propagandist literature. But I think that what we need to be very careful in making, uh, you know, what we're careful about in making that distinction is not to reduce the political to the propagandist. You know, I mean, there is literature that is political, yeah? And political literature is not necessarily propagandist. Yeah, propagandist is already a reduction of, uh, of political uh, creative writing, which is a, a completely different realm. Yeah. Uh, and I have, uh, for instance, if, if you took um, the um, radical uh, writing uh, that came from uh, the left movement uh, in uh, at different points of time, you will actually be able to um, quite clearly uh, set apart even within that large uh, yes. body of writing, you will be able to separate the political from the propagandist. And so I think that uh, while making that distinction, and, and, and the political is also deeply, uh, I mean, you have social critique that is fundamental to the constitution of the political, even in that space, right? So I think that we, when you kind of make this distinction between social critique and propagandist, it's a bit of a, of a problem for me because, uh, you know, uh, it still means that um, the space of the propagandist is, is reductionist already. So, uh, you know, you do then need to, uh, to sift out the propagandist from the political and not to conflate the two just because they have a certain political persuasion. Right. Thank you. Uh, well, I have, uh, I will uh, for a moment just dwell on the two points that you made, if I understood them correctly. One was uh, you were uh, uh, making a very interesting observation that through corruption complex, through this idea, we can uh, have a uh, grip on this elusive category of what uh, defining corruption would be. Uh, that is one. And the second larger point that you were trying to make, uh, which I thought, I mean, uh, that uh, throughout the paper, this issue of corruption was brought out in a way that it obstructs notions of justice. No. So I would just, and uh, I, I will just, I just want to dwell a little bit more, uh, keeping in mind the two. Uh, texts that you mentioned, especially the works of Akhil Gupta, where it's very clear that the issues of corruptions are largely uh, moments of structural violence of the state. And uh, Ranajit Guha, where insurgency was something which was part of a community consciousness. And 
this kind of methodological critique, I mean, and this is something which I say that Partho Chatterjee says that methodologically using this insurgent metaphor or the community consciousness metaphor after neoliberalism is something which you don't see this kind of community consciousness in terms of insurgency. And he makes this particular point, not only a methodological point, but a historical point that you can't see peasantry as uh, no, this kind of uh, reflection of community con consciousness. There is a far more uh, uh, dispersal that has happened within the notions of community through migration and other historical and sociological uh, sort of uh, events that it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to actually think in that particular way. Now, I just want to say why there is a, and I see a curious omission. I mean, especially if I look at the works of Veena Das, especially after 1984 riots, though she agrees to the fact that police or the CRPF or is something which is you no know, adding to the woes of the people, but she also found some state officials, some bureaucrats in her ethnography who were deeply uh, concerned about the concerns of uh, about the riot uh, about the people who have been victim of riots, and they played a very significant role in restoring their selves and rehabilitating them in those riot prone areas. Now, in these, uh, especially Hargopal, Professor Hargopal, Ashish Nandi kind of formulation, and that is something I'm just, and these are half-baked ideas, I'm just trying to think through the famous uh, statement that he made at Jaipur Literature Festival saying that you know, when we talk about corruption, it is generally the, uh, understood as uh, corruption of the elites. So there is a certain kind of liberal morality around that and liberal notions. So I'm just trying to understand that why uh, this kind of, uh, uh, this there is certain kind of, I won't say emancipatory potential, because it's very much true, the political movements, JP movements and other, and even Hanna Azare movement, there was this kind of axiom that was developing around corruption, that this is something which, you no, know, which hits at the liberal uh, understanding of morality and the common poor might get, might be a beneficiary of a corrupt regime. No, so that sort of that sort of contradiction, and I think because that would make the corruption complex argument more elusive and more interesting in the sense that it would take up these questions. Second, uh, I mean, even um, well, I mean, for time being, I just uh, want a response on these two half baked ideas. I would say I don't know if I would I was able to make sense of it. Um. You know, I mean, in, in looking at uh, the idea of insurgency, uh, and, and I'm, uh, I, I was actually quite specific. I was not making uh, a general statement um, that uh, in, the insurgency is found in particular ways. I do think um, that even while its shape and form shifts, you will still be able to find very deeply insurgent moves uh, in uh, e even in uh, uh, you know a polarized or because of the kind of polarized polity that we have today. So I wouldn't go with Partha Chatterjee's argument there. Uh, I do think that uh, it is uh, something. Uh, I mean the the the, uh, the embeddedness of insurgency and a particular articulation of the political is something that we are seeing around us all the time, particularly in the last year and a half, you know? Uh, so I, I don't think that uh, it is an idea that uh, we don't need to explore. And uh, the, the articulation of that insurgency, the articulation of uh, corruption through the insurgencies that we have been witnessing around us, has been happening with reference to the filing of false FIRs, uh, you know, the the uh, uh, with reference to illegal arrests, with re reference to um, the uh, lack of transparency and accountability in the criminal justice system, ranging from the lowest officer to the highest uh, court. Yeah, uh, so this is exactly what I mean when I talk about the corruption complex, that you cannot then disaggregate the, the one officer in the captive cockatoo, uh, the institution, you can't disaggregate one captive cockatoo. Yeah, there is a whole, there, there is a whole uh, 
web of uh, corruption, uh, a complex in which they are actors. Yeah. And that need not always, and this was my main point, that they need not, I mean, we tend to, uh, we tend to associate uh, corruption with a bribe. Yeah, you pay 100 rupees to get an FIR registered. You pay some money to get the lawyer to appear, although he is supposed to appear in a murder case. You pay him a little more money. You get pay money to the prosecutor to make him stand up in court and not come drunk. Uh, these are the uh, stories, you know. I mean, the, the, the problem is that the stories that circulate are always stories of uh, the Daroga level, yeah? Uh, and uh, so, and, and and stories of economic offenses, yeah. And and it's not as if that is not true. It is true. I mean, in in the uh, casework that I have done, I have actually, uh, as recently as six years ago, come across a, a case where uh, an Adivasi man was arrested uh, by uh, an SHO, and he was beaten. And uh, there was no arrest warrant. And basically, the demand was you get 5,000 rupees uh, deposited in my uh, you know, police station, and I will stop torturing you. So is it economical? Is it not? Is it oppression? This is an Adivasi man. The police officer is not Adivasi. He holds state power. Um, and there is physical beating and there is an economic consideration. You give me money, I'll stop the beating. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is the, uh, you know, the, it is that nexus uh, that I think uh, very often gets completely lost in, uh, you know, in, in our understanding. And which is why when you look at uh, Akhil's work, uh, the, the whole question of structural violence, but it is also particular expressions of structural violence. You know, I mean, in each of these novels, that there, there are also very, very raw descriptions of violence that I just kind of uh, did not dwell on to at all, um, uh, because I actually don't have the stomach for it. I've done looked at too much of casework on violence on the ground for me to be able to deal with literary imaginations. Uh, or reproduce literary imaginations of violence. I may read them, but I can't reproduce them. Uh, but uh, they are thick with, uh, with, with, uh, with um, uh, accounts of uh, the exact manifestations. So structural violence is not an abstract category. It is embodied in very, very particular ways. And uh, in, in that sense, you know, uh, you have very thick descriptions that on reading it, you know, is not at all far from the ordinary. On the point of there being uh, officers who are good, yes, there are officers who are good and there are judges who are good and there are uh, many who are not. So I think, you know, we are pitted, uh, we, we are forced to pit the anecdotal against the statistical. Yeah. And uh, this is the problem. So on, on, on a large plain what? I mean, one of the authors uh, of, um, that, that I have chosen, uh, Vibhuti Narayan Rai, was the person who acted on the Hashimpura massacre. Yeah, I mean, he was later vice chancellor of the university in Vardha. But, he was actually uh, transferred and the case was posted to CID and then... Sure, was, sure. But I mean, if you, if you talk of, if you talk of uh, officers uh, who have been diligent, then of course have been officers who are diligent. But uh, you can actually count them on your fingers, you know, right from 1950 to now. Uh, and you won't, uh, you know, uh, cross to a three-digit mark, I guess. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the idea is also on a common plane. You know, I mean, if you, if you just step out and uh, talk to people uh, about the, have you encountered, a, and, and this is a worthwhile exercise. I often think I should do something like that, maybe now. Uh, you know, the, that you, you talk to people on where they have actually intimately encountered the state and uh, get their accounts of what the exact nature of that intimate encounter with the state has been. 
that will give us an idea um, of of why and where these narratives are coming from you know so uh, actually on on the complex itself i i it's just a, a, you know a, a, way, a kind of a germ of an idea i didn't have the idea before i had read all these six it was after i had read these and and yashwan chital's uh, the seventh uh, novel it was after i had read all seven and i kept thinking about what is it uh, what is it that seems to speak the novels do speak the stories do speak to each other but what is it about the stories that speak to each other at it's at that point that i uh, kind of uh, it, it occurred to me that uh, probably uh, you know we could map uh, the corruption complex uh, more as a way of coming to grip with the intractability of corruption you know it's not as if it will solve anything but why is corruption intractable why is it that you just uh, cannot get a handle on it yeah right from uh, the uh, the mysterious murders and deaths of investigating officers and judges to the mysterious encounters and impunities two mysterious deals in aircraft dealing and central vistas and everything else why when it is evident and self evident is it still intractable and why can you not pin it down you know so it, there is a larger uh, there is a larger picture and uh, possibly it gets it it gets um, you know uh, opened out uh, within particular state formations maybe you know if it is a, a, the colonial state it, it it there is a certain way in which the imperial state figures uh, if it is a, a nationalist uh, government there are particular ways in which it figures so you can get those calibrations but uh, yeah i don't know if i've answered your question but that's basically no thank you so much i mean uh, it really helps me in thinking about that still today accounts of local registers local engagements with the state the local bureaucracy which akil gupta so importantly takes out so he keeps the two registers together the national register and the local the regional register but he finds problematic more uh, uh, closer to the local register the local bureaucracy and so yeah it will help me to think over some of my questions more clearly thank you so much so we don't have much of time left so we are bringing this session to close Uh, so I thank Professor Kalpana Kannabiran for a wonderful presentation. We would like to hear more from you more often, and uh, thank you, participants and faculty colleagues, and thank you so much, students. There was many questions which I could, cannot take, so I'm very sorry for that. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you thank for being here, ma'am. Thank you.